manageable though. All right. Yeah. Can you just tell them that I'm just getting the stream set up so quiet? We're just getting the stream set up. Rich is saying that's why it's a little bit quiet over here. Uh, Thomas, um, yeah. Have you ever been asked to do any uh, DVD cover art? DVD cover art? Yeah. Any? Uh, I'm just thinking, you know, like, uh, like here, what, you know, they could have taken your image and uh, oh, not more really. copies, uh, you know. <laughs> they did use the. They did use the image on a couple of uh, um, uh, books. Um, um, that you could buy at, you know, Barnes and Noble or something. So they use that twice. This is my son. Let me get it real quick. Um, yeah, Elijah, I'm getting ready to go on on here. What's up? Yes, I did. I sent I sent it to you twice. <laughs> All right, because after this, I'm going to cut my phone off. Okay. Okay, remember the, the last one you got is the one to go for. It, it'll tell you that because the first link I sent you was the wrong link. Okay, bye. You got you to register. Well, maybe they'll get it. Okay. Thomas, have you seen Black Widow yet? You strike me as a Marvel fan. Am I uh, wrong? To be honest with you, I was a DC fan. But <laughs> oh, I yeah. have to admit, Marvel has wiped them off the map, Jack. Yes. So especially with the movies, because the uh, DC movies have been horrible. I, I, I can't believe they've done such a bad job with them. I mean, I 100% agree. Marvel. What's that? I 100% agree. Yeah, yeah. It's really disappointing to me. And the only thing I hate about what they did to Batman was they never put him in his original costume. And that always, I always said, why won't they ever do a movie of the way he's supposed to look? So anyway, I don't want to <laughs> go off on a tangent on that like I did with King Kong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that will come up potentially. I don't know if, I don't know if it will or not, to be honest with you. <laughs> I hope I it think, does. Tim, uh, whoa, Tim Burton, I think he did some hoodoo on people where they just think. Oh, oh okay. Oh. oh, yeah, the meeting is being recorded now. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, no, I, I plan on seeing it. It wasn't great, but. It wasn't? It, yeah, it wasn't really that great. It was kind of boring. Was it better than um, the last uh, Wonder Woman? Um, no, I, I think they're about equal. I'd say it's probably a little bit worse, <laughs> which is which is pretty, which is saying something. Well, I never really have been a, a Black Widow fan anyway, so it really doesn't matter to me. Yeah. <laughs> All right.
All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, I am your host, Drew the Dragon Slayer Thomas, coming to you live, both online and in person from the Norman Rockwell Museum. If you're unfamiliar with the mission of our museum, it is to illuminate the illustrative power to reflect and shape our society and to advance the enduring values of kindness, respect, and social equity that's portrayed in Norman Rockwell's art. So as usual, before we begin, I'd like to read our land acknowledgement. <clears throat> it is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the indigenous peoples of this land on which our museum was built. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors' past and present and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So I'd like to welcome you all to the second installment of our Tuesday program, Meet the Artist Series, where we, uh, we'll be in conversation with some of the most talented illustrators and painters of our generation, as well as you all, the audiences, both online and in person, who we encourage to be a part of the conversation as well. For our, um, so throughout the program, we consider we invite you all to consider any questions or comments you might have. For our online audience, please just leave it in the chat, whether you're watching through YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo, or Zoom. Leave your questions or comments in the chat, and I'll find space to bring them up at some point during the conversation. For our in-person audience, please just make it known that you have a question, and I'll bring uh, the microphone over, at which point you can ask the question to the artist yourself. So we'll go ahead and get started. First, I'll introduce Jesse Kowalski, um, who has spent the last six years organizing exhibitions at the Norman Rockwell Museum. As curator of exhibitions, he organized the groundbreaking exhibit Hannah Barbara, the architects of Saturday Morning, as well as Inventing America, Rockwell and Warhol, with co-curator uh, co Stephanie Plunkett. Never Abandoned Imagination, the Fantastical Art of Tony Dieter Lisi, and the art and wit of Rube, Rube Goldberg, among others. Kowalski, who wrote and edited a 240-page exhibition catalog published by Abeville Press for our current exhibition, Enchanted, a History of Fantas uh, Fantasy Illustration, which includes 140 works by 100 artists. Prior to joining the Norman Rockwell Museum, Kowalski worked for 18 years at the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. While there, he organized several popular exhibitions on the art of Andy Warhol that traveled around the globe, including Andy Warhol Portraits, The Prince of Andy Warhol, From A to B and Back Again, and Andy Warhol, 15 Minutes Eternal in Addition. In addition, he curated the first exhibition on the work of legendary comic book artist Alex Ross, which traveled to the Norman Rockwell Museum in 2012. I pass it off to you, Jesse Kowalski. Thank you, Drew. Uh, over the past four decades, uh, Thomas Blackshear has been through several career changes. Uh, he has illustrated for greeting cards, movie posters, advertisements, magazines, collectibles, the U.S. Postal Service, and art galleries. Uh, when I began organizing the Enchanted exhibition for this summer, I spoke at length with my good friend, illustrator James Gurney. I asked him if there were any fantasy illustrators he would recommend, and he gave me just one name, Thomas Blackshear. A graduate of the American Academy of Art in Chicago, Blackshear first found illustration work in 1977 with Hallmark Cards as an apprentice for illustrator Mark English. After a brief stint with Hallmark, Blackshear worked for a handful of artists before deciding to be a freelance artist in 1982. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Blackshear was hired by Universal Studios, Disney, National Geographic, and the US Postal Service, which commissioned Blackshear to create several series of postage stamps featuring legendary jazz musicians, classic film monsters, 1930s movie stars, and a series of African-American heroes for its Black Heritage series. In 1993, Blackshear released the African-American tradition, Heroes of Our Heritage, a portfolio of images from the last series, which included Rosa Parks, Dorothy Height, Ida B. Wells, Martin Luther King Jr., and others. In 1995, Blackshear fought to create a series of collectibles of African-American figures titled Ebony Visions, and he is currently painting images of the American West in a style he has dubbed Western Nouveau. 
Thomas Fletcher's paintings are infused with the influence of the artists from the golden age of illustration. Uh, one of the highlights in our enchanted exhibition is painting of Beauty and the Beast is inspired by the Art Nouveau painter Gustav Klimt. Another painting in the show, preparing to sound the alarm, is a stunning image of an angel blowing the shofar in anticipation of Judgment Day. Blackshear has created other dramatic images of angelic figures in such paintings as The Awakening, Forgiven, and Watchers in the Night. And in 2006, the Vatican celebrated Blackshear's work with a solo exhibition. Uh, throughout his career, Thomas Blackshear has accrued a number of awards for his work. Um, a humble man, uh, Thomas has, has uh, commented that he isn't the best artist, but he tries to be the best artist he can be. In, 2000, or in 2020, the Society of Illustrators inducted Thomas Blackshear into his Hall of Fame alongside other acclaimed illustrators, including Edmund Dulac, Jeff Jones, Barbara Nessim, and Drew Struzan. And that's not bad company. Uh, welcome, Thomas. Thanks for having me. So we'll start your slideshow if you want to. Um... All right, would you like to comment on the slideshow? Yeah, this is uh, when I first started out, I was going to um, the Chicago Institute of Art and I uh, heard about this smaller school down the street called the American Academy of Art. So I went over there to check it out and I was very impressed with the uh, quality of work. Uh, the first year students work at the Academy of Art look better than the uh, graduate students work at the uh, Chicago Institute of Art. And so I got a chance to meet the Dean of uh, the school, his name was Irving Shapiro. He was a very famous watercolorist. Anyway, after seeing my portfolio, uh, he decided he was going to give me a, a free 10 week scholarship. And uh, he said, before I do that, what I want you to do is I want you to go home and draw your room. And so this was the drawing that got me into uh, the Academy of Art, American Academy of Art. So. Uh, while I was there, I was in the fundamentals class with Mike Desetnik, and it was the illustration class. And uh, this is one of the first assignments we had. And uh, the uh, painting on the right, uh, The Wizard of Oz uh, with Dorothy, that was the first time I think I, I ever used the airbrush. Uh, this was an illustration we had to do about our summer. And that summer was 1976, and it wasn't the greatest summer for me. That's why I, I got that drab look on my face. But the highlight of it was working at an art studio in Atlanta. Um, and um, the name of the studio was Graphics Group. And I did a painting of a, a lion for one of their uh, illustrations. And so that's why I put it in there that way. So. Uh, this was another assignment uh, in my fundamentals class. This was probably one of the last assignments I did before I graduated the school. This was done in acrylics. Um, I look back at this now and I kind of laugh because I was a Ray Harryhausen fan and I really wanted to be a special effects artist. So I did this, uh, homage to him, I guess, in a way where I say, Harry Allison look out like, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, these are some of the sculptures I had done with a, a drawing of my face in the middle of it. And uh, so that was one of the uh, three-dimensional assignments I had done. And like I, I've told uh, Drew and Jesse, I go ape over King Kong. So <laughs> this is... Uh, one of the illustrations I had done in school, art school. And then um, I did later on, quite a few years later on, I did this sculpture of King Kong on top of the Empire State Building. Oh, Thomas. Yeah. We've got our first question. Yeah. Um, the question is, do you feel like they've done King Kong justice in the recent movies? And do you, who do you think would win out of the originals, Kong or Godzilla? Well, Kong will win, of course, but the movies were horrible. That's all okay. I got to say about that. I hated them, okay? Anyway. Thank you. <laughs> but um, 
this was an assignment where we had to do uh, something like a TV guide cover. And at the time, uh, Happy Days was popular and the Fonz was the, the guy. So I did this illustration of the Fonz. I think this was the first time that I had used, no, the second time I had painted in acrylics. Uh, and um, we, we always had to do a, a chair uh, as, as an illustration and I had to paint it. So that was my second attempt at uh, acrylics. Uh, when I did that illustration of that eagle that you saw earlier, this also was a piece I had done at the same time I did that eagle. So like I said, this was one of the last assignments I had done before I graduated. Um, I wanted to impress the teachers of the school when I was at the American Academy of Art. So I did a series of all of the faculty and they were so impressed with it, they, they hung it in the office uh, so after I did that, I decided to do a caricature of my classmates in my uh, illustration class. And uh, so these were all of the people in my illustration class and I'm in the middle right there. This is when I worked at Hallmark Cards. Uh, while I was there, Mark English, uh, the uh, famous illustrator was teaching a, 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 a class uh, at um, Hallmark for um, the employees there. And I was able to get into the class and uh, I did two illustrations in his class. And after I did the uh, cowboy, um, he asked me if I would become his apprentice. And that was one of the most incredible opportunities I've ever had in my career to be able to work alongside Mark English. Um, Thomas, we've got a couple of questions about your education. Yes. Uh, one of them asked, do you have any good stories about your time at the American Academy of Art? Who were some of your classmates? Um, I have uh, quite a few friends that I still keep in touch with. Uh, uh, Carolyn Hoshaw at the time and um, Sue Colage and Lowell, Lowell Hoyt. And um, let's see, I see... Uh, uh, quite a few people I'm trying to remember their names. Uh, Frank Lokensaw, that's the guy that's got the balloon head. Uh, and then Mike Desetnik was my teacher. And he's the one standing to the, the right side here. He always wanted to be a famous uh, Western painter. And when he left the school, he became a well-known famous Western painter. So uh, he lives out here in Colorado, in Durango, uh, Colorado right now. So. Thank you. And then the other question is, uh, Thomas, you said in art school, you made A's or F's. What did you mean by that? Um, well, maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but I guess I will. <laughs> <laughs> On every assignment, I got an A and I got an F. I got an A for the work, but I got an F because it was always late. And the reason why I was always late was I had decided in art school that when I graduated, I would walk out of that school with a portfolio that could get me work. So I didn't care if it was late. I just wanted to make sure that once I was graduated, I didn't have to do my portfolio over again. And so that's why I, you know, I, I didn't care. I, 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 the work was good. That, that work helped me get jobs and I didn't have to redo my portfolio. Thank you. Do you want me to ask that question? Oh, I think that answered the question. Yep. Okay. okay, this was a painting I had done for a book called Elf Spire. Uh, I had to do nine paintings and 63 ink drawings, and the book was never published. It was the first time I got burned. But in doing the paintings, this was one of the paintings that I had done uh, for the series. And later on, I found out that uh, when they did the movie Dragon Slayer, they had this pinned up on their wall as inspiration for the dragon that they made for that movie. This is a painting I did called The Witness. And um, 
I uh, saw a friend of mine named Ezra Tucker had a, a note in his studio that he wanted to do a painting of a black lion with wings. And I saw it and I asked him if he wouldn't mind if I uh, could uh, do a version of that painting myself. And he allowed me to do that. And this is what I did. Um, so uh, I didn't have reference of the, the lion the way I needed it. So I ended up sculpting the lion so that I could get uh, exact reference, photograph it and get exact reference for my painting. Well, those were many, many years ago. <laughs> this is me working on the uh, collector's plate for the Wizard of Oz. And eventually that, that's, that plate in the picture won um, uh, collectible of the year. I think it was uh, the, the collector plate of the year. So that was quite a while ago. And this is another one of my um, collector's plates. I did the first Star Wars collector's plates. And this was the commemorative plate, which was the last plate in the series where you show all of the characters in, on one plate. And uh, these are a few of the images from the post office. This is the uh, movie poster stamps. And then the monster stamps came quite a few years later. And I know you're a film fan. Which was your favorite monster? Well, Wolfman was my favorite monster as a kid growing up. But as far as the, uh, as the stamps go, my favorite stamp was the Phantom of the Opera. Thomas, we, uh, we have a couple questions about your early artwork. Yes. Uh, the first one is, what happened to the pictures you made during your training? Where are they now? And what happens to your originals now? Um, I sold a lot of the earlier pieces. And I've got a few of them hanging around, just a few. Not very many, though. But most of them I sold years ago. And then someone to ask, what is your favorite artwork from your early career? And how did you start working with the USPS? Um, well, there are a few assignments that I had that uh, I was excited about, but there was a painting that will be coming up soon of a dragon that I had done that I really liked. And uh, unfortunately, when I tried to get it back from the client, they, they said they lost the artwork. But anyway, um, the way I got into doing uh, US postage stamps was one day when I was living in California, I was running an errand. When I came back home, uh, there was a message on my answering machine and it was uh, Jerry Pinkney, who's a very well-known illustrator. And he told me that he really liked my work. He had been following me and he had been designing uh, US poster stamps for the uh, Black Heritage series and he wasn't gonna be doing it anymore. And he was wondering if I would be interested in taking it over. And of course, I was very excited to do that because when I was Mark English's apprentice, I always admired the fact that he had done a few postage stamps. So I was really thrilled to be able to get that job. Thank you. In just a moment, we have a question from the audience. Um, postage I'm so sorry, just one second. I'll be bring this to you. Uh, on the postage stamps and the commemorative plates, was that work done partly digitally or was it all done by, by hand? I'm sorry, I'm a dinosaur. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I only do it by hand. I don't do it on the computer. Thank you. And then um, just because we were just talking about this, somebody asked, you got burned when the book was not published. Did you not get paid for your work? Would you have gotten paid by commission? And what is the payment process for illustration? Thank you. Well, that's a broad question. But that particular book, um, yes, I got paid for the initial paintings. But I, once the book was published, I was also supposed to get royalties. So that never happened. So, you know, it was a real complicated situation. And I, yeah, I did. I, like I said, it was my first job that I got burned on. So. Thank you. And one more question, just because we were just talking about this. They ask, will you paint another Star Wars plate? I don't really think so. I, I've, you know, that was quite a while ago. And uh, 
I'm not really doing any plates right now. Um, so I'm not sure if that's going to be in my future. Thank you. Now, this was an important painting, right, Thomas? Oh, King Kong? Yeah. Of course. That's King <laughs> Kong. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to do a painting of King Kong. Like I said, that's my favorite movie, monster, and favorite I, I, all times. I mean, I've seen how it's influenced almost everybody in Hollywood who does special effects. Um, but anyway, I always wanted to do a painting of King Kong. And the feeling that you get from looking at this painting is how I felt about the intensity that I wanted to bring forth in what I felt about King Kong. And I was very excited about it because it all felt the way I wanted it to. And uh, it was what, what I would call a successful painting. Another one of my favorite paintings is Beauty and the Beast. And um, this was done in the style of Gustav Klimt. And um, this is one, like I said, this is one of my favorite pieces. Uh, everything on this one worked and um, I'm very excited that it, it's uh, showing in the Norman Rockville Museum right now for the fantasy show, so. Yeah, um, Thomas, I've, I've had a number of people comment about this painting as being one of their favorites in the show. And I was wondering uh, why you think people are drawn to it. Um, I hope it's because of, I just wanted to do something that was decorative, very nicely designed and just a painting that uh, brought uh, a nice, peaceful, uh, serene feeling to it. And the colors, I, I think the colors worked really well. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't know what it is, but I, hopefully they're, they're getting the same sense that I was getting as, as I was painting, so. Our online audience ask, uh, why did you choose to emulate the style of Klimt in your Beauty and the Beast painting? I, uh, my mentor, Mark English, introduced me to uh, Gustav Klimt, and I had never seen the guy before. And when I started really studying him, I just, I was just so impressed with his skill and his talent and his design sense, incredible designer. And, uh, and I like how he uses realistic form with flat graphic shapes and I just started wanting to learn how to incorporate the two. And um, so I still, to this day, like doing the decorative paintings. Thank you. Um, speaking of that, artists that inspire you, somebody asked, what artists inspire you? Oh, man. I mean, you opened up a Pandora's box there. I mean, I, there's so many people I like, so many people. But of course, the golden age of illustration, I studied Gustav Klimt a lot, Alphonse Mucha a lot. Of course, Norman Rockwell and um, NCYS. I mean, Maxfield Parrish, the list goes on. And then there's quite a few contemporary people that I admire, and there's so many of them. Uh, uh, all the way from comic book artists to uh, illustrators today. I mean, there's so many people that I admire today and I look at. Thank you. Did I say anything about beauty? Oh, no. I mean, this is a <laughs> intimacy. No. Okay. This is intimacy. Uh, this is a painting about, uh, I'll break it down for you. I got the idea to do a painting about intimacy. What is intimacy? Intimacy is getting to know the person behind the mask. The heads in the background represent all of the masks that we wear in the world. And the plain face that is her mask you really don't know uh, who a person is on the inside uh, unless you get to know them. And the only way you usually see them is through looking at the eyes because they say the eyes are the window to the soul. So though I painted it where all the colors are on the opposite side of the mask. That's why the mask is real bland looking. And then you see her real true colors. She represents every woman. I mean, the, the model I used was uh, Filipino. Uh, I gave her green eyes and I uh, gave her brown skin, and, but I wanted her to represent all women. And then um, the garden behind her represents who she really is, the beauty or inner beauty and the garden of her delights and all of that. She's wearing a red robe of passion that she's taken off. And you only usually take off uh, or, or reveal yourself to somebody when you're intimate with them. And so as she's taken off the red robe, 
that bright light is her true self coming out. So that's what the painting is about. Thank you. Um, and you literally, you just answered half of this question, but somebody asked, do you use live models for your paintings? And if so, who are some of your subjects? Always, uh, usually friends and family. I don't use a lot of models from agencies because I had an experience where I had to pay a lot of money to use models from an agency and they were so stiff, I couldn't even uh, use the images. So I just use family uh, and friends, people I'm comfortable with. And, uh, and that way, uh, I, I, they're a little bit more free with me that way. Thank you. This was a painting I had done for Disney Studios on the uh, cartoon series, Gargoyles. And um, I, I really like the paint, way the painting is. I just wasn't really pleased with the, um, the way they printed it. They printed it on a paper that absorbed a lot of the ink. So the colors came out a lot more dull than what you see here. But all in all, I enjoyed doing this project. This was an old piece that I had done when I was uh, first, I think I was, I don't know if I was just starting to be a freelance illustrator or not, but anyway, it was for Budweiser beer. And the model was Mark English's son, John English. He posed for this piece uh, many years ago. This is the dragon I told you about. Uh, this was for Michelob beer. Few of the heroes upon the globe who deserve the reward of Michelob. I don't know about all of that, but anyway, I enjoyed doing the painting <laughs> of the dragon. So, uh, excuse me, Thomas. Somebody asked, your art was phenomenal even before Hallmark. What type of instruction did Mr. English provide, and how did it improve your art? Well, um, Mr. English was doing during Hallmark. But um, I had a really good art teacher from Atlanta. His name is Curtis Patterson. And he, um, I really appreciate him because he was an artist himself. And uh, he was a sculptor. And he would have the whole art class do pots. But he didn't make me do pots. He let me do what I liked doing, which was figurines. So I would do figurines and ceramics. And um, he just let me do my thing. And uh, I really appreciated that. Thank you. And we were talking about this before, but just to return to your Beauty and the Beast, uh, somebody asked, when you composed the face of the beast in your Beauty and the Beast painting, did you look at any specific creatures for reference? I was, I had an idea of how I wanted the beast, but after I saw Walt Disney's Beauty and the Beast and that beast design that Glenn King did, that did it for me, man, because that thing was beautiful. And so the bulk of the beast is what I liked. So I started making my beast a little bit more bulkier. And, um, and then I made it, I drew it in a way where he was very realistic looking. But as I was composing the illustration, I realized it probably would be more effective if I was to um, uh, make the beast look more graphic looking and give him more of an abstract design than, um, than their reality that I was uh, originally gonna use. And so when I kind of, uh, you know, made more straight lines or more curvy lines in the beast and made him look a little bit flatter, I think it served for a better uh, image. And so I was really pleased with the way that came out. Thank you. And uh, speaking of your process, just one more question here. Can you talk about your painting process and what is your process from beginning to end? All right. Um, I'm a stickler. I think somebody asked me if I've always been a perfectionist, but I guess you could say in a way I have been, I'm, I'm a stickler for trying to get it right. I'm the kind of guy that when I'm working on a drawing, uh, I will do that drawing as many times as it takes to get it right. Meaning that if I do it three times, it's not right, I'll do it six times. If it's still not right, I'll do it nine times. And then after nine times it's not working, well, I guess I'll move on because it's something's not working. But usually I won't even touch the canvas until that drawing is correct. And then I figure out what the colors are gonna be in my color room. Once all that is done, then I will proceed to the canvas and start painting because where I'm at right now, I don't have the time to start big paintings that I don't know how to finish because something's not working. So I work all that stuff out first to make sure that when that painting is done, it will 
uh, it will be finished the way I wanted it to be. Thank you. And actually one more came in and it's a perfect question for what you're talking about. They ask, what are the pros and cons of being a perfectionist as an artist? Um, well, the pros are you'll get closer to what the image is in your head. Uh, the cons are that it'll take you a little bit more time than you expect. I don't have Thank a problem you. with it. It's the process that I use and it is very effective for me. Thank you. This is a painting I had done for uh, a mascot series for Budweiser Beer, a calendar mascot series. And um, I forget the school, but their uh, mascot was the pirate. And this was the second attempt on the job only because the art director, the first guy uh, that I did, he didn't think he was, I don't know, bold enough, strong enough. And so I did this guy. And um, a friend of mine posed for this, his name is Douglas Clava. Uh, he posed for this years ago and stuff. And I did it kind of uh, influenced by um, um, J.C. Leindecker. And this is one of my favorite paintings of all time. Everything kind of worked on this one. Uh, this was a painting I had done for a photographic company. And the caption was, you can blow your images up this big. And, um, and of course, the woolly mammoth was highly uh, inspired by uh, Frank Fazetta, the king. So this was done in gouache. I think it was in gouache. Anyway, this is a uh, night and day. Uh, this is a special painting for me because this is the beginning of the new look of paintings I started doing. Uh, when I did this painting, um, I was asked to be in a show and I had never done a painting for a show, so I didn't know what to do. So I went into prayer and I prayed to God. And I asked him to give me an image that was a nice composition, nice color, and nice design. And in a few weeks, he showed me the image. I saw the image in my head. And after I saw it in my head, all I had to do was match what I saw. And I named the painting Night and Day. Um, and this was the first of me receiving images like that after I prayed to God. Uh, and I've done quite a few paintings that way, but this was the beginning. Yeah, Thomas, you had mentioned before that in the early 1980s, you'd gone through kind of a slump uh, for a couple of years. Yeah. And I was wondering, how did you pull out of that? And was re religion a big factor for you? Well, I'll, I'll tell you the story and I'll let you decide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what happened was I had gone through a, a depression for three years. I had never been through a depression before and it, it ruined me. I mean, I was at the top of my game. I was making a lot of money. And all of a sudden this thing hits me and things that brought me joy in life, it didn't mean anything to me. And I had to struggle through this thing for three years. I know now I went through a clinical depression. I remember um, a friend of mine came to visit me who be eventually became my wife. And she was looking for a job in San Francisco and she was having a problem because people weren't calling her back and she was kind of upset about it and she kept talking about it and I I just said to her look you know I've been going through something myself and I can't talk to anybody about it and she said well what have you been going through and I said I've gone I'm gone I'm going through a depression I said here I am at the top of my game and everybody wants to be me and do what I do and making the money I make but it means nothing to me my art means nothing to me I have no joy anymore and I don't know what to do about it this thing has been on me for three years and I don't know how to shake it and I said to her, I've lost interest in everything. I said, the only, only thing I have, and this is what I said to her. I said, the only thing I have is the faith to believe that Jesus is gonna help me through this. And when I said that, I heard what I said and an understanding came to me right then, which was Jesus was all I had, Jesus was all I needed. And as soon as I said that, this thing that had been on me for three years just came right off of me, right, right in front of her. And I started crying uh, because, you know, when you go through something like that for three years and you don't know how to shake it and all of a sudden this thing just comes off of you. I was like, and then I, I was crying and laughing at the same time. And I said to myself, my, my goodness, if I would have known this, I could have been through this thing three years ago. 
you know, but uh, but that's what happened. That's how I got delivered from depression. I know a lot of people that have gone through depression and and have, you know, and they deal with it for the rest of their lives. I just am so thankful and blessed because that's how it came off for me. All right, thank you. Another piece in the exhibition. This is called uh, Preparing the Sound the Alarm. This was a piece that I had done a few years back for a show that I was supposed to be in and I forgot that I was supposed to be in the show. And they called me up and said, well, Thomas, well, we're looking for your paintings there. The show's gonna be in about three weeks. And I was like, oh my goodness, I forgot. You know, I didn't tell them that, but I knew I forgot and I had to get to work. So that was the first time I had worked on three paintings that I had gotten done in 10 days. Now, the truth of the matter is I didn't really get them done. I got them done enough to put a frame on. But this was the only one in the show that after they were in the show, I, I actually finished the piece. And uh, so um, I was really pleased with the, the way that this one uh, turned out. Now, out of all the paintings I've ever done in my career, this is the number one painting that people know of all over the world uh, for me. This is uh, Forgiven. And this was the, this was the, this was the third, this was the third time I had prayed for a painting and he showed me the painting. And all I had to do was copy what I saw. And at the same time, I already knew what the name was, which is Forgiven. And this painting has, stories behind this painting so many 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 stories of people that are i remember the biggest story or should i say the story that i would hear all the time is when this was first started being um sold in the bookstores the christian bookstores the uh, book dealers would tell me all the time numerous people would come in see the painting fall to their knees and start crying i heard that so many times that over the years, when people would come up to me to tell me that, I'd go, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, because that's how many times it would happen and stuff. But uh, th there's a lot of other things. I think I told a story one time of how a woman, um, she went to a bookstore with a big piece of uh, molding, a wood molding, and she gives the story that her whole house burned down, the whole house. And the only thing that survived the fire and didn't get burned or anything was this painting in the door frame. So she was going to take the door frame and turn it into a frame for the painting. Right. This uh, is Thomas, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Uh, question from Anthony Thaxton. I wasn't sure if that was the story that you just said, but uh, they asked, can you tell your mother Teresa's story about this painting forgiven? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the mother Teresa story is some years ago, I had a friend who went on a mission trip to India. And um, he, every time they would go on a missions trip, I would give them some of my Christian images. Uh, I'd give them some of the copies of my posters and I'd give it to them and say, whoever you feel to give them to, give it to them. And so they were in Calcutta and they were there for a whole week. And the last day they were there, they were looking up at Mother Teresa's compound, really wishing they could get in there and meet her. Well. There was no way they could go in. They didn't know anybody to talk to or anything. And all of a sudden, this little kid comes out of nowhere, and he goes, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, come, come. Grabs them by the hand, pulls them into an alley, and then they walk through this door, and then there was a delegation of Chinese uh, delegates going to see Mother Teresa, and they walk right in behind these delegates, and they got a chance to meet Mother Teresa. And then uh, after meeting her, they presented her with, uh, a copies of my prints, a copy of this one and a copy of the painting I did called Watchers in the Night. Oh, no, no, Coat of Many Colors, Lord of All. Coat, Coat of Many Colors, Lord of All. Anyway, you know, I was, I was shocked when they called me and told me what had happened. I'm like, I, I can't believe it. That's really cool. Well, a year later, one of the guys who was with my friend went back to Calcutta on a missions trip. And while he was in the airport getting off the plane, a nun came up to him and said, you were here last year. And he says, yes, I was. How do you know that? She said, because you presented Mother Teresa with, with some prints. And I was there when you did it because I was the one who was helping her with a wheelchair. He said, oh, okay. And she said, uh, and this is after Mother Teresa had passed away. 
So she said, would you like me to take you around the different ministries we have here in Calcutta? And he said, sure. So while she was taking him around, he was hoping that she would, uh, he would see the, the print somewhere because Mother Teresa asked him, would you mind if I put this uh, in the home of the dying? And so he was expecting to see these prints somewhere on, in the different ministries they were doing. And then afterwards he said to the nun, I thought I was gonna see the prints that we gave Mother Teresa, but I didn't see anything because she said she wanted to put them in the home of the dying. And uh, the nun said, no, no, you, you misunderstood. What she said was, do you mind if I put this in the home of one who is dying? And she was talking about herself. So the nun took her into Mother Teresa's room, which they turned into a shrine. And on one wall is forgiven and on the other wall is uh, um, Code of Many Colors, Lord of All. Thank you. Sure. Now this was, oh. Yeah, I just wondered if you could talk about the uh, how the uh, figurines came about and if you got any resistance. Yeah, um, I was contacted by a company called Willits uh, and I was asked to do a line of figurines. Uh, I remember the um, uh, president of the company was Joe Wallsmith and uh, he came to me and said, Thomas, we're interested in doing a line of figurines uh, and I said, okay. I said, so what do you want? Do you want musicians? And they said, he said, yeah, yeah, we'd like that. I said, how, how about um, dancers? You want dancers? He said, yeah, yeah, we want that too. I said, how about uh, the Africana stuff? Uh, you want that too? And he said, yeah. I said, yeah, well, I'm not interested. And he said, well, why? Why, why aren't you interested? I said, because every time somebody does a black figurine, that's all they ever do. And I said, he said, well, do you have any other ideas? I said, yeah. And he said, I said, because if I do a black figurine, it will be something nobody's ever seen before. He said, well, why don't you put some ideas together and let's have a meeting and uh, let's see if we could, uh, you know, see what we could do with it. I said, okay. So we had two meetings and both meetings, the first meeting that he had uh, eight consultants. And in the second meeting, he had 16 consultants. But even in both meetings, the consensus was the same. Most of the people hated it. Half, I mean, half the people hated it. Half of the people thought it was okay. But even after it was all over, Joe Wallsmith was the man who said, Thomas, I don't care what they said. I'm going to do it anyway. So he took a chance on me. And um, we developed the first six figurines in the line. And after a two month period, it had made the company their first million dollars. And then it just took off like a rocket. And uh, Ebony Visions became the number one selling black figurine in the nation for 20 years. So I was very pleased with uh, how Ebony Visions was succeeding. And even the fact that in the collectible industry, this figurine line changed the minds of the people who produce figurines, because before I did Ebony Visions, they said that black people didn't buy figurines. And my argument was that's kind of ridiculous. They don't buy them because you don't put anything out there that they want. And so that's how this one came about. Okay. And here are two more. Now, I also wanted to point out when the line got so popular so quick, that they came to me and they said, well, Thomas, you know, because these things are selling so fast, because I wanted to sculpt them and paint them, but I couldn't do both of them because, you know, it took too, too, too long. So he said, why don't we do this? Why don't you design the figurines? And then we'll go to Mark Newman. Mark Newman used to be a, a student of mine in my illustration class who was a sculptor and he was an amazing sculptor. He still is today. And they said, uh, let Mark sculpt them. And I had a little problem with that because my name was on it to have somebody, you know, else sculpt my figures for me like that. But anyway, Mark, like I said, he's an incredible sculptor. He did most of the figurines in Ebony Visions. I did a few. The piece here of the old man praying, it, that was called the prayer. In that particular piece right there, I did the head and Mark did the body. But the other piece over here is called the dark night. Mark did the whole figurine. But um, like I said, I had a, a problem in the beginning uh, with uh, 
you know, somebody else doing my, my artwork for me. But after I got my first paycheck, I didn't have a problem with that anymore. <laughs> Thomas, yeah. uh, speaking of the dark night, even though this isn't what you're talking about, somebody asked, if asked, would you ever do a painting for a comic book cover, say Spider-Man or Batman? Well, let me put it to you like this with Batman, okay? I sent my portfolio into DC Comics and they lost my portfolio three times. And then when I called them to try to get it back, the guy who was handling the incoming calls cussed me out. And I never forgot that. And, but I always, you know, I would, if I ever had the time, because, you know, I'm real busy now, of course I would love to do a Batman cover. I mean, because I always want to do, but I'll be honest with you, Batman's not easy to do because I guess any popular comic book artist is not easy to do because there's been so much done on them. What do you do? You know, but no, I've always wanted, especially in my early years, I always wanted to do a Batman cover. But um, anyway. Thank oh. you. And I'm sorry. We've had this question for a long time. So uh, somebody asked, why did you decide to go in a different direction with your paintings? What do you mean diff different direction? Well, I guess they don't, they're not there to answer that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, different direction. Well, I guess one thing I could say about that is I was growing as an artist and after becoming an illustrator or as I was making the transition from being an illustrator to an artist, there's a big question you have to answer. What is that question? Who am I? How do I think? What is important to me? What do I want to say as an artist? And as they clarified the, the nouveau direction, uh, the nouveau direction. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, well, this is still answering the question. So yep. the biggest challenge is as an illustrator, you do artwork that you're usually art directed on to sell products, which is a really good skill to have because you learn how to convey stories visually. Well, but still when you want to become or try to become more of a fine artist, then you gotta figure out who you are inwardly. So I've always loved Art Nouveau, Art Deco, Arts and Crafts. I've always loved Golden Age of Illustration illustrators. And so because uh, I've been in heavily influenced by that, um, that is the direction I'm going. And I guess I've been doing this for so long, it seems like it's kind of, it's just there in my artwork now. It's a part of what I do now. So. That's, um, that's how I've gotten into this, these other things. Once I found out what I wanted to do, it took me some time to adjust, but now I know who I am as an artist and I know where I'm going or want to go with what I do. So, Thank you. Uh, do you have a subject that you haven't painted yet but would love to? I don't know. I mean, I, mainly I do people and animals, you know, um, Maybe one day I can start trying to do some landscapes, but my love is people and animals. Uh, um, but no, there's, I'm sure there's quite a few things that I would like to experiment with in the future. So we'll see what happens with that. Thank you. And a, a quick question. Uh, do you do color comps? If so, how many? I do, well, it, how, however many it takes, because every time I do a color comp doesn't mean it works. Sometimes I'll do one, sometimes I'll do three, sometimes I've done five. So, but whatever will bring me closer to what I feel the vision is in my head, that's what I'll go with. And sometimes it takes a little time to get to that point. Thank you. Yeah, Thomas, if you could talk about this work that's been compared to Rockwell's Golden Rule painting. Um, this was a painting that a lot of people will be surprised to realize this painting, believe it or not, took me 21 years to complete. And this was the process. When I first started working on it, I was with a, a company called the Greenwich Workshop. And um, I was working on it. And I had a different hairstyle for the Native American. He was gonna be more of a Navajo or short cropped hairstyle. But I didn't, every time I drew it out, it didn't look right. And I didn't have anybody who had the hairstyle to pose for me. So I didn't know what to do with it because it just wasn't working. So I put the drawing away, the drawing on the canvas away. And I didn't pull it back out until five years later. Pulled it out, said, okay, I'm going to fix this. So I fixed it, started working on the painting, and then I ran into another problem. I didn't know what to do with it. So I put it away. Five years later, I pull it back out, 
So that was the process of why it took me that long to get the thing painted. But um, I'm so glad that I did it because I, this is one of my, another one of my favorite pieces. Uh, it's a painting that represents the uh, uh, brotherhood of man. Uh, um, more, uh, a lot of the races, uh, black, uh, black, white, red, yellow, a golden uh, thread comes down from heaven, makes a design on the African and jumps over to the Asian woman, makes a design on her, jumps on the white woman, makes a Celtic design, goes back over to the Native America, makes a design on him, goes back up on the African and then goes back up to heaven. And then they're all holding candles that represent the spirit of God in their life. And that's why the name of the painting is called A Common Thread. And of course, heavily influenced by Gustav Klimt. Uh, when I, the first time I ever did a painting for the Western Market was uh, the Booth Museum. Uh, the curator of the museum was um, Seth Hopkins. Uh, found out about me and asked me if I would uh, uh, consider uh, being in the show. And uh, so he asked me to do that. So I got into the show. So I decided to do two paintings of black cowboys. The show was called Blacks in the West, which had never been done before. So I did this piece right here called Now What? And um, to my surprise, this was the only piece of the show he, that the museum bought. So it's the first painting of mine that I ever did that was bought by a museum. So um, I, I like the way it came out for my first one. This one now, this is getting into some of the Western art. This is the new stuff that I'm doing now. This is the what? This, the name of this piece is called Native American New Vault. This particular piece is what I would call the essence of what I feel Western Nouveau uh, represents. It has everything, all the feelings that I want in there and uh, it just really worked well for me. So, but this is the, uh, the uh, signature piece for my Western New Nouveau look. Somebody asked what inspired you to talk about Western art. It's a big departure from your other work. Um, I went through a really hard time uh, three, six years ago, went through a very, very nasty divorce. And then at the same time, I was being sued by the company I did my figurines for because I wouldn't renew my contract. And so I was going through hell. And um, on the 16th, uh, what, 2016, Morgan Weisling, who's a good friend of mine and is a very famous Western uh, illustrator, Western artist, uh, was trying to get in touch with me and he wanted to let me know there was a shift going on in the Western market. And because he had always been following my work, he just wanted to know if I would be interested in getting into it. And he said that he would do anything he could to help me get into the Western art market. Uh, he would may introduce me to people, galleries, museums, whatever it would take if I was interested. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to paint. He said, I'll check on you throughout the year and after the year is over with, I'll take you to one of my shows and introduce you to people to see if we can get you into one of these shows. So that's what happened. We went to the, uh, the show at the Masters of the West show at the Gene Autry Museum in 2017. And while I was there, um, he introduced me to people. And when the show was over with, um, I walked away with a gallery. And then I started doing Western art and I've been doing it for four years now. And that's how I got into it. The name of this piece here is called Fancy Feathers. I always wanted to do a painting of an Indian and a peacock. So I decided to do it this way, which is a little di different than uh, what most people would expect. But this is one of the more successful uh, Western pieces I've done. Uh, this one is called Taking Flight. This is another one of my favorite pieces. This is the more decorative, and this is called Buffalo Hunt. This is another decorative one, and this is called uh, American Nobility. You know, you're using gold gold leaf, it looks like, in all these. Gold leaf, yeah. yeah. These, these are the decorative ones have the gold leaf on. I do three different styles, realistic, stylized, and decorative. And these are the decorative ones. Decorative ones, I use the gold leaf in. Uh, this was a piece that was done for the 
Jackson Hole, Wyoming Chamber of Commerce uh, last year. And they turned into a poster and turned it into banners. And then last year at this big event, they auctioned the painting off. And uh, the name of this piece was called uh, uh, Hunter's Watch. This one was the show that I put in the Gene Autry Museum uh, this year. And it got um, Artist Choice Award. And uh, the name of this painting is called The Weight. Uh, this is one of the contemporary pieces that I did last year. And the name of this is called Airman's Inspiration. Thomas, somebody asked, how do you approach color in your artwork? Well, um, you know, there's a lot of things to think about when you get into color, color theory, but mainly one of the things I use a lot is the color contrast, cool up against warm. That's something you'll see a lot of. I also use shading or shadows. And sometimes I, the painting will be lit, lit from the front or like with this piece you're looking at right now, uh, the painting will be lit from the back. So in the name of this one is called Taking Aim. And this was in, uh, I just came from the, the pre to West art show in uh, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. It's my first time in there. And thank God this painting sold. And then uh, there's another painting you'll see that sold. So um, I was glad that that all happened. This is the other one. This is called Thunderbird. Yeah, how did you get involved with the, the group, The Killers? I, uh, last year, I got a call, I mean, an email from uh, the manager of The Killers telling me that uh, they, The Killers, this group that I had never heard of, uh, was um, very interested in wondering if I would be willing to let them use a piece of my artwork for the cover of their album, and said that the lead singer, uh, had been a fan of mine for quite a while, which was a surprise to me. And uh, so uh, I, we worked out all the details. I let them use the, the, this for the cover. And then they told me that, um, you know, we, we even think that we might want to use the rest of your artwork on our singles. So I used this for the cover and I did think I did five more paintings that were singles that I used. I got a painting as a matter of fact right now called Mighty Wind that is gonna be at an auction uh, um, uh, on the 30th of July at the, um, what is it, Coeur d'Alene auction. And so that painting was for the Killers album single and uh, that would be auctioned off on the 30th, so. Yeah. Now here's a view of your painting, uh, preparing to sound the alarm in the exhibit. Now how does it feel to have your work next to a an engraving from the 1500s and Gustave Dore and, and the contemporary artists. I mean, of course, incredible, but come on. I'm, I'm in the Norman Rockwell Museum, man, come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm very honored to be there and uh, with these incredible painters. I mean, and my stuff is hanging next to them. I mean, that, that's mind boggling to me. So I, again, I, ask, I, I wanna thank you for asking me to be in the show. Thank you. And here's your Thomas, uh, there's a good question here. Um, they ask, can Emily ask, can Thomas recommend a path for people who are interested in developing their own style of art? Okay, I can give you a, a philosophy. And I got this philosophy from my mentor, Mark English, because I asked him about that one time when I was uh, his apprentice and I was a young guy trying to find my way. And I said, um, I said, how do, you, how do you come up with your own style? And he said, you know, the best approach in coming up with your own style is you go back to the, the old guys, you go back to the masters and you study what they do. Their, the way they put together a painting, the composition, the design, the color, and you learn about what they do. If there's something that excites you about their painting, try to dissect the painting to understand what it is about that painting you appreciate. And then what you do is you take that old look and you tweak it just a little bit so that it's familiar, but it, it has a whole new look. 
and I never forgot that. Thank you. Now, Thomas, you were at the opening. Uh, what was it like to see about 20 of your fellow uh, artists? It was amazing nice. meeting some of these guys that I had been a, a, an admirer of for many years. And they were all so nice. And we all got, got along so well. And um, I mean, it was really fun. I, I really had a good time. Yeah, this is Greg, Greg Manchester on the left, Donato Giancola. Yeah. And then uh, yourself here. I, uh, I I got to know uh, uh, Don. We we um, we uh, did a hike together and stuff. So it was good meeting a new friend. And uh, he's an amazing, amazing painter. And and so is uh, um, uh, I look at my mind going out on me. You, <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe. <laughs> My mind's going out on me. You know I know who you are. But anyway. Yeah. So, Greg Manchester, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. Terrific. Well, that's all I've got here. So I'll uh, stop sharing. I think maybe a good final question. Somebody asked, "How does it feel to be an inspiration to not only young African American artists but other young illustrators as well?" You know, that's a hard question for me to answer. Of course, it's an honor. I mean, it truly is an honor. It's just that because I'm all, I, I live by myself and I'm always in the four walls trying to get a job done, you know, I don't know who sees my stuff and who doesn't. So even though people say you're famous and you're this and that, I'm shocked when they even know who I am. So, you know, of course, I mean, uh, it's an honor. You know, when I realize people, and not only that, when I meet people tell me I've been watching your stuff for many years, uh, that's a surprise to me too, because, you know, I don't get out a lot and stuff. So no, it's, it's truly an honor. And uh, I just hope that I would uh, encourage them to just go after their dream and try to be the best that they could be. And uh, don't ever let anybody tell you what you can and can't do. You're the only one who can determine that by, um, the time and the efforts that you put into trying to develop your talent. Thank you. Oh, Thomas, if I could just ask one more thing. Uh, you mentioned that we might be reading about you sometime soon. Someone's working on a book? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, me and my buddy, Anthony Thaxton, we're working on a book of uh, uh, my artwork. And hopefully we can get that thing together soon. And uh, but it's coming. So, perfect. Well, that was a very productive conversation. I'd like to thank everyone for being here. You're all part of a growing audience of people who understand the work of illustration artists and the profound effect that it has on the way that we think of things. We've had around. We we've had hundreds of people attend these events. So I'd like to thank you all for making it a great discussion. Our next program uh, will be in a week. At, I think on July 20th, we'll be talking with Tyler Jacobson, a popular artist for periodicals, advertisements, and games such as Magic the Gathering. So before we end, I'd like to uh, invite you all to become a part of the community in a stronger way by becoming a member. I'll go ahead and um, drop a link to become a member in the chat. Uh, there it is. And you can use that link to find out about joining the community and all the benefits you get. It, it only takes a minute and it links you to great programs, talks, workshops, and exhibitions for a full year. So once again, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jesse Kowalski. And thank you, Thomas Blackshear, uh, Thomas Blackshear, for being a pleasure to work with and for talking with us today. Thanks, Drew. Yeah, thank Thanks, you. Jesse. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear it, but there's lots of clapping. Yeah. Oh. <laughs>